Hi, I'm Andrea Lynn. Welcome to Sunday Morning Worship for Western Mennonite Church. This Sunday, later on, we'll be hearing from one of our speakers from Mennonite Convention uh, in our Greater Mennonite Network. Uh, and I'd like to introduce you to some uh, worship thoughts that were put out by our Executive Conference Minister, Catherine Jameson Pitts. Thanks be to God. 2020 has been a year of unplanned changes. As the COVID-19 pandemic spread across the world and in our neighborhoods, we reacted by physically distancing from one another, including canceling our PNMC annual gathering, which would have been this weekend. The plans we had made were disrupted, but we are still God's people, connected by the Spirit in ways we do not always understand. As I have seen the congregations respond to changing demands and needs, I have been surprised to find myself filled with gratitude. I wonder what it would look like for PNMC to be a community of gratitude, together and apart in this time of disease, of division, of distress. And so I offer these worship materials to be used on what would have been the weekend of our annual gathering in the hope that despite being separated by distance, we might worship together, give thanks together, and know that through the Spirit, God makes us one. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are our God and we are your people. And that no matter what challenges separate us, that you are always our God, always faithful, always loving, always present. God, we thankful. Amen. I come before you today And there's just one thing that I want to say Scenes that I cannot see. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. With a grateful heart, with a song of praise, with an outstretched arm, I will bless your name.
done in our lives, we want to say thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes, we do. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. God has called us together with congregations spread across the Pacific Northwest. We live in cities, small towns, and rural areas. We worship in English, Spanish, French, and Swahili. We gather in groups of 10 and 200, in homes, churches, parks, and online. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. God has called us together with congregations spread across the Pacific Northwest. To be followers of Jesus. To witness God's peace. To experience transformation by the Holy Spirit. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. God has called us together with congregations spread across the Pacific Northwest to worship today. Together, though apart, God hears our voices as we gather and give thanks to the God who is good. God's steadfast love endures forever.
Sue Parker is the denominational minister for leadership development and transformative peacemaking for MCUSA. She is also the co-director of a peace center in Los Angeles called Reconciliation, specializing in conflict transformation and restorative justice for immigrant churches. She is trained in intercultural development inventory, sexual abuse investigations, and is a strategies for trauma awareness and resilience practitioner. With her husband, Hyun, Sue feels most humbled by their children, Gun, Lynn, and Yul, who remind them that peace begins at home. Please welcome to the stage, Sue Park Her. Reconcile your people. Guys, this has been incredible. Um, oh, wow, you guys are way up here. This is awesome. Wow, it looks totally different from up here. Hi, my name is Sue Parker. I'm the denominational minister for Mennonite Church USA. And I'm just feeling really amazed um, and full. Um, I didn't have dinner, but I feel full um, being in this space with you all. 40 years ago, I immigrated to the United States. Our family moved to the suburb of Los Angeles. And there weren't many Asians who looked like me. Most of the people in my school were very friendly, but there was this one girl, and I think she was having a bad day. So she came to me, circled around me, and started taunting me. She said, Ching Chong, Ching Chong, you Chinese chink. I did not know how to respond to that. And my biggest, I guess my best comeback was, I am not Chinese. <laughs> well, that startled her, because she thought that was like a really cool way to like bully me, right? And then she said, then you, you stupid Japanese. And then I said, and I've got a little bit more relaxed now, right? Because I know her comeback is very simple. And so I said, I'm not Japanese. And she looked all flustered and she said, then, then what are you? And I said proudly, I am Korean. And she said, thank you, thank you all my Korean folks. I know you guys like K-pop or something, K Korean drama or something, right? <laughs> and so her comeback was, what's that? Mind you, 40 years ago, Korean, Korean culture was not as popular as it is now. Although these days, I don't regularly get these blatant racist remarks directed at me like I did in the playground when I was eight, I do still get that quizzical look of what are you when I, people, when I tell people of my denominational affiliation. My Korean friends have no idea what a Mennonite is. What's that? Is their common response. My friends who have heard of the Mennonites are also confused because they have a certain perception of what a Mennonite should look like, right? Perhaps a head covering, plain clothing, and it's not Asian. 
I joined the Mennonite church not because of the unique fashion statement, quilting, the great secondhand stores, potlucks. or even the great four-part harmonic music. What drew me and my husband to the Mennonite church was the reputation that the Mennonites had of being a faithful peace witness as followers of Jesus. Yes. We heard about a small group of folks who for over 500 years tried to seriously follow Jesus, the Prince of Peace, and this intrigued us. This intrigued me and my husband because we were born in a place where civil war had ravaged a country. Its people, its land, our very heart and soul. The war had directly impacted my family even though it happened before I was born. You see, my father was 17 years old when in 1950, the Korean War broke out. And he was drafted. Anybody here 17? Yeah. My father is an introverted, quiet, loving man. And he had to take arms. And he saw things that a 17-year-old shouldn't see. And that damaged him. And for the rest of his life, he had suffered PTSD. We didn't have a terminology as such when I was growing up. All we knew was he got really weird. And when he got really weird, <clears throat> our family really couldn't talk about it. Because mental illness, especially in an Asian culture, is a taboo. It brings shame. And I didn't want to bring shame to my family. I didn't want to bring shame to my dad. And so we would use kind of code language. If my dad started acting a little weird, he drove in different ways, or he started just doing odd things, we would look at one another, my brother or my mom, and we would say, is he sick? And we would nod. And we would try to do life adjusting to his patterns. The scars of the war had been branded on the lives of our parents and our grandparents, and that trauma had been transmitted to us and our children. 69 years later, North and South Korea are still divided, and the Korean Peninsula is considered one of the most dangerous places in the world with nuclear capacities to start a world war. We wanted to learn how the Mennonites understood peace and what Jesus had to say about peace. We wanted to understand how to live in this violent world of perpetual war. What is the role of the church in a world where violence seems to increase power all the time and peace seems hopelessly idealistic? Is peace even possible? When I came for answers to the Mennonite community, the Mennonites wanted to hear, hear my story. And today, <laughs> I've been invited to talk about peace here with you all. So this is very surreal for me and quite humbling to stand here to talk about such a central topic to our denomination. Honestly, it's really hard to talk about peace because we're living at a time when we are so divided that we cannot talk about giving water to the thirsty, food to the hungry, without controversy. We cannot talk about family separation without fearing how the other person will re react. We are afraid of each other and our future together. And to this chaos, Jesus enters and says, peace be with you. We can theologize about the significance of this declaration that all things have shifted because of the resurrection. We can talk about the new creation 
being formed and declared. We can celebrate that Jesus is coming and saying peace be with you is to declare that the power of violence and chaos, death and destruction will not get the last word. Jesus will get the last word. But in the most basic sense, peace be with you is a traditional greeting. Jesus shows up and says, hey guys, what's up? He greets them in an earthy and ordinary way in their language and cultural expectations. He returns to say, hey guys, I'm back. The movement is not dead. It is very, very alive. Greeting is a powerful way, is powerful. Just saying peace be with you, just looking at each other and greeting is powerful. It's a new way to connect. For example, my husband has been to North Korea multiple times before the travel ban imposed by the US. And not surprisingly, when my husband prepares to go to North Korea, our church folks get a little nervous. Will he be safe? Will he be able to get back? You know, all kinds of stuff. They're more worried about him than I am worried about him often. So the weekend before he went into North Korea, he asked our church, church, can I send a greeting if I have the opportunity to go to an official North Korean church? And yes, there are official North Korean churches in North Korea. He said, if I go, can I give them a greeting from our church? Our church, like 30 people, mostly non-Asian. It was a, it was a predominantly white aging church that we were pastoring. And so they, we asked them, in the name of Jesus, on behalf of Mountain View Mennonite Church, can we go and say greetings? Can we send them your blessing? And they were like, what? <laughs> they weren't so sure because politically we have different views about North Korea, right? So my husband asked again and again <laughs> until he got a forced yes. <laughs> a reluctant yes. When he went to North Korea, he did have an opportunity to go to one of the churches, it's called Bongsu Church. And there he had an opportunity to speak. So he went to North Korea and he said, Mountain View Mennonite Church, in the name of Jesus, sends their greeting and they want to bless you. And they responded, Amen! <laughs> like the whole group. And you know, these things are communist folks, right? Like they do it with a resounding like, Amen, right? <laughs> it's such a simple thing, just to say, give, exchange a greeting. But it was powerful. It was the only thing that my husband could do. He's not a diplomat. All he could do was send a greeting and then bring this greeting back from that church back to the US. Although we are small in numbers, Mennonites are known across the world for faithfulness and recognizing that peace and reconciliation are at the heart of the gospel. And I think this makes the Mennonite peace witness unique. We have the gift of tradition and stories that have been embodied in our faith. I think some of us take this for granted. We can't take this as a, it's a true gift that this church, this, this world is really longing for. So how will we share these beautiful and messy stories, these embodied stories of peace, so that the peace of Christ can be shared? Our stories are not perfect, but they are stories that have been embodied for the last 500 years. I think John 20 shows that peace begins with being present. Notice before Jesus greeted the disciples, it says that Jesus came and stood among them. 
Jesus stood among the disciples who were traumatized and deeply afraid. But we also see a more intimate picture of Jesus in the earlier chapter of John 20, when Jesus came and stood with Mary. We see Mary weeping, lamenting that her Lord is gone, that his body has been taken away. And while other disciples are running around trying to figure out what happened, she sits, sighs, breathes, and cries. She sits there offering the gift of her tears, her vulnerable words wanting to see the Lord. We see through Mary the gift of lament for herself and her community, and Jesus stood with her and called her by name. Peace begins with Jesus, who stands amongst the traumatized. Peace begins with Jesus sitting with Mary's tears and disciples' fears. You cannot move quickly through peace. Those of you who do a lot of peacemaking know this. You cannot sanitize, minimize, or hasten the pain, the loss, and fear. But to fully be present and see the broken world as it is, it is this, through this prophetic lament that peace begins. Like Mary and the other disciples, it is when we recognize the presence of Christ that we too can be fully present. We too can stand among and sit with our pain and the pain of others because we recognize that Jesus is there. He is here. It is the gift of standing among and sitting that our own fears and the fears of others can be embodied. This witness is a powerful way to be a peace witness. These are my peace witnesses in the Mennonite church. They have taught me how to sit with our fears and to lament. That is where peace begins. Mennonite Church USA, many of us are fearful, fearful of the future of the church. We have experienced loss and confusion and sometimes it is so painful to see what has happened to the church that we just wanna move on. But let us pause, sigh, breathe, and cry out to truly see. And as we lament, we may see Jesus standing with us. Secondly, not only can we embody the gift of peace with our presence, but also with our proclamation. It says, said peace be with you, said. Sometimes we hesitate to proclaim and to speak the hope and the gift we have received. We hesitate to talk about Jesus or to proclaim his name because we have seen the name of Jesus and the scriptures used as a weapon to provoke violence. We have seen the misuse of Jesus' message so much that we shy away from the Christian language altogether. This is understandable, but I believe the Mennonites have a significant voice and a message to speak into the larger church in understanding the peace of Christ. We need courage to share what our peace convictions come from. We have a message to proclaim with our actions and our words. Just yesterday, we wrestled and I met people in our denomination who have taken this call of peacemaking seriously with their words and actions. We recognize that Mennonites do not have a corner on peace. We think we sometimes do, but if you look outside of our churches, other denominations and other followers of Jesus are doing a pretty darn job, good job. But we do have a distinct gift to contribute, whether we are organizing in our local or global communities. We need to continue to wrestle with who we are, what we are doing, and how we can better connect to do the work of peace. I wanted to end by telling you about a friend who has helped me to understand this embodied peace. 
in the midst of fear. Sang Hwan Kim is a dear friend. He's a woodcutter, woodworker, and the, found, and the founder of Kana Creation. Sang Hwan is also an ordained pastor. Two years ago, a nonprofit that my husband and I run formed a team to go to North Korea to do a reconciliation forum. Now, because of the travel ban imposed by the U.S., we were not able to go. But the team still decided to go to the border of China and North Korea. If you don't know where North Korea is and where China is and all of that, do some, do some uh, geography, guys, okay? You don't want to be like the bully, right? We went up to Mount Pekdu, the tallest and the most sacred mountain in the Korean Peninsula. For Sung Hwan, his primary goal was to find pieces of wood from this famous and sacred mountain. It was super cold, 18 degrees. Remember, I'm coming from California. I do not understand 18. But he was able to pick up a few pieces of these fallen branches, and a few days later, his family and my family, we went to the very southern tip of our peninsula and went to an island called Jeju. It was, it's an island that was formed from a volcanic rocks and it has formed this beautiful mountain called mountain, Mount Hala. And there he found pieces of wood from the branches. And when we returned to the U.S., from Asia, he worked with two pieces of wood, one from Mount Hala and one from Mount Pektu, to create the Reconciliation Cross. When I share the story of this cross, and do you see the form? What does it look like? It looks like two people embracing, right? Excuse me. I share this story with many people, but my friend Shannon Dykus, the rock star, I don't know if you guys have ever met Shannon Dykus. You guys need to meet Shannon Dykus. She said, well, this cross embodies peace, doesn't it? We go to the edges, we gather what we can, and we create. You guys went to the edges of these two different mountains. You guys gathered what you could, and you guys created something. This is what we're trying to do, right? We're called to go to the edges, places where the marginalized people are. Some of us here are the marginalized people. It's not just somewhere over there, but we have marginalized people in this space. We go to them. We go to these places that are hurting and we gather. We gather the stories, we gather their songs, we gather their history, we learn, and then we try to create something and to bridge something from that. That is the work that we are called to do. Friends, we need this promise of peace embodied in this cross the cross of resurrection, that gives us the power and the peace to embrace each other. Our church needs this cross at the center of our work. I actually brought one because it's kind of neat to see it, right? It's right there. Although the United States is not physically divided like North and South Korea, we need to reckon that we are divided people. We need to embrace that although we are a historic peace church, there are places in our church that have grown apart. Our call is not to walk away from each other, but to meet and embrace. We need to embrace until we see the image of God in the other. This embrace is the sign of peace. Peace be with you.
To embrace each other is not to minimize our differences, but to see that our differences, like these two different pieces of wood, enriches it. Christ's embrace is wide and vast. And in the process, we'll be surprised to see where peace was not expected. We have work to do. Let's embrace the fact that even in our division, Jesus embraces us. He's gracious to extend the gift of peace. We need the resurrection energy by embracing Jesus and one another. Church, let us widen and deepen the container so we can lament, for that is where peace begins. Let us recognize that peacemaking work is to be embodied in our actions and words, and that this will take us to the edges, to gather, to create, and to embrace. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord, we are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord, and we pray that all unity may one day be restored, and they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. We shall walk with each other. We shall walk hand in hand. We shall walk with each other. We shall walk hand in hand. And together we spread the news that God is in our land. By our love, by our love, yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Greetings to the congregations of the Pacific Northwest Mennonite Conference. I'm Catherine Jamison Pitts, the Executive Conference Minister. Our conference is made up of 29 congregations scattered across a vast and beautiful geography from Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Montana, and Alaska. Our congregations worship in urban areas and rural. We have small churches and large. We worship in English, in Spanish, and in French. We meet in homes and parks and, of course, in church buildings. As a network of faith communities, we seek to connect Anabaptist congregations with the leaders, skills, and resources they need to be authentic witnesses to Christ in their communities. We help congregations through pastoral transitions and in planning for their future. We provide opportunities for both lay leaders and pastors to gain new skills and to strengthen their ministries. We do this by working together, learning from one another, and sharing with each other. We are one of 16 area conferences that make up Mennonite Church USA, and so we draw on the resources of the Mennonite Church from using Minnow Media publications to encourage faith formation for all ages, to joining the Corinthian plan to provide insurance for pastors. We partner with Mennonite Mission Network to host young people in service adventure and commission others to work in Jesus name around the world. Through Mennonite Health Agency, retirement communities in our area learn and share with others across the country. We send young people to Mennonite colleges and receive pastors who have studied in our seminaries. 
Our congregations also participate in wider Mennonite organizations, contributing to the relief development and peacemaking work of Mennonite Central Committee. We support camps in Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. Our past is archived by the Pacific Northwest Mennonite Historical Society. PNMC congregations engage with partners in our communities as well, working with others to provide food for the hungry, to care for those without homes, to work for justice, to speak to the particular needs of the places we live. Congregations in our conference are different in some ways. Our styles of worship, our cultural contexts, the programs we offer, but we are similar in many others. We like to play together, to pray together, to nurture our children and youth, to serve our communities, to grow in following Jesus. And we especially like to eat together. This year we experienced a dramatic and unexpected change in our church lives as the COVID pandemic emerged in our communities and the spread of the coronavirus meant that we had to find new ways to meet. Congregations learned to use new tools, video conferencing, live streaming, uploading videos, and as we learned those skills, the reach of our congregations grew. Congregations that had long ago abandoned a traditional Wednesday night prayer meeting found themselves praying together regularly over Zoom. Gardeners and crafters demonstrated their gifts on Facebook Live. Sunday school and Bible studies continued in a new format. Singing to the ill or grieving happened from afar. Drive-by fellowship was invented. Worship services grew to include those who lived far away and those nearby who had stopped coming to church. We now find ourselves in another unexpected and dramatic moment that calls on the church to change. In a time of widespread societal reaction to the racism deeply embedded in our culture and our church and ourselves, we are invited to act. Some of us may march, some study new things, some pray, some write laments, some sit and listen deeply. And again, we are blessed by our connections to each other in PNMC and by the resources provided by Mennonite Church USA to help us engage the current times as God's people. In a year when things around us have shifted in ways we could not predict, we have discovered that we have much to be grateful for. God continues to work in our lives and in the lives of our congregations and communities. God blesses us with connections and resources. God gives us strength and courage to do new things and grow as new creations. God's love never fails. The congregations of the Pacific Northwest Mennonite Conference are a people who have committed to follow Jesus, to witness to God's peace, to experience transformation by the power of the Holy Spirit. May we be people who live out those commitments in many and varied ways across our vast and beautiful geography so that Christ might be glorified in all we do and say, amen. We're now going to enter into a time of prayer and I'd like to share with you a prayer that I believe Captain Jameson Pitts uh, wrote and it's one that's gonna be prayed across many congregations and churches in the Pacific Northwest Mennonite Conference today. So let our voices unite together uh, as we pray to our Father God. Dear God, giver of life and hope and love, God, the one we turn to with our tears and our thanksgivings, we come to you this morning together with all the congregations who call ourselves the Pacific Northwest Mennonite Conference. 
We have much to lament and to confess in these days. We lament that we cannot gather as a conference of congregations this weekend and confess that we have not always worked to develop relationships with each other. We lament the disruption in our ways of being church and connecting with each other and confess that we have often done only what was easy and traditional for us. We lament the death of over 100,000 killed by the coronavirus in our country, including our own brother from the Jerusalem congregation, and confess that we have not shared the burden of disease nor of access to health care. We lament the racial violence done to black bodies by forces we support with our money and confess that we have been silent too long and ignored the reality of racism in our own lives. We lament the rise in unemployment and bankruptcies in our nation and confess that we have not given from our treasure to care for the needy. Hear our cries of grief and our words of repentance. Grant to us your grace. Surprise us with your grace and healing, O God, that we might find ourselves being made whole and turn to find you in thanksgiving. We have much to be thankful for in these days. We give thanks for your spirit blowing a fresh wind through our lives, through our churches, through our streets, and we are grateful for your invitation to move with that wind. We give thanks for old relationships given new life as we worship online. And we are grateful for new relationships fostered by creative ways of engaging. We give thanks for opportunities to share our wealth and mutual aid and our privilege in confronting power with truth. And we are grateful for strength when we falter. We give thanks for companions on our journey, for the network of care you have woven among our congregations, for the resources of our denomination. And we are grateful that we are not alone. We pray together across the miles in the hope that we might be made one, in the faith that you walk with us and surrounded by the love made known to us by Jesus, our Lord. May we be the church for one another and for the world. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Thanks to God for my Redeemer. Thanks for all thou dost provide. Thanks for times now but a memory. Thanks for Jesus. Stretch out your hands before you. Peace be with you, sons and daughters of God.
for whom creation groans, we are made manifest. May we again and again experience that power that resurrected Jesus from the dead. I declare grace and peace multiplied to you all from ravaged lands or bounty-filled pantries on this terrestrial globe. Let his shalom that surpasses all understanding by the power of the Holy Spirit overwhelm us past all isms. I declare the excellence of the very peace proclaimed by the angels on that night divine to propel us to radical love with benevolent abandon, setting our hearts on fire for neighbor as self, the stranger, the poor, the widowed, yeah. the orphan, the hungry, the thirsty, the broken, the imprisoned and creation. Turning gun to plowshares and pipeline to solar panel. Tonight, let our hearts burn with zeal as our faith with works cause his kingdom to prevail in this generation and beyond. Go now, go in God's peace and change the world with him and through him. Leave no one behind from A to Z America to Zimbabwe, the bride and spirit, Kai come Lord Jesus, the tables are turned over. Yes. Peace be with you. Amen.